hopefully you're in the right room for digitally enabled continuity of care. Um, I'll introduce my panel first so that they don't have to stand there waiting. Um, first, we've got Professor Elwyn Lowe, who's the Chief Medical Officer and Group General Manager of Clinical Governance at St Vincent's Health Australia and Adjunct Clinical Professor at the School of Clinical Sciences at Monash Uni. Uh, we've got Dr Bernadette Ether, who's the Chief Nurse and Clinical Services Director at Ramsey Healthcare Australia. And Dr Jason King is the Director of Clinical Services at Gurini Yalamaka Health Services in Cairns uh, and Ewan Noongar Primary Care Physician. And online, hopefully, she's also zoomed in, we've got uh, Darlene Cox, there we see you, thank you, who's the Executive Director of Healthcare Consumers Association, a board member of Meridian and of the Capital Health Network. And of course, like with the other sessions, you can get their full bios mm. online on the uh, virtual platform. So, continuity of care, uh, obviously is good for patients and good for the system. We know that it contributes to reduced mortality, fewer emergency department visits, fewer hospitalisations uh, and higher patient satisfaction. Uh, and good for the system because it results in lower healthcare costs, uh, keeps our funders happy, uh, but particularly important for patients with chronic illness where we know uh, that patients who've seen their GP within two days of hospital discharge have a 33% lower chance of readmission within the next week compared to those who didn't see their GP. So we know that that continuity matters uh, and we also know that digital health has an important role in that continuity of care, uh, that sharing of information with obviously appropriate consent and safety parameters and good clinical governance uh, between health professionals and between different systems of care, uh, like between primary care and hospital care or across the primary care sector, helps make those transitions easier and improve those patient outcomes. But we've got a long way to go for that journey to be seamless uh, and I'm probably preaching to the converted here for any clinicians in the room and actually service operators in the room who understand the challenges of trying to use those technologies or have access to technologies to make uh, your workflows easier and your patient outcomes better. So our panellists today are going to explore some of those issues uh, and like the previous sessions, it's an interactive one, uh, so please pop up your hand and we've got roving microphones uh, for questions from the floor and we'll keep an eye on Slido uh, once we can get that and, and be able to answer questions there. And I'm just double checking that you can see, oh yeah, you can see everyone on that screen, brilliant. Um, so we'll kick off, while you're all thinking of questions, I might kick off with a question for Dr Lowe. Uh, Dr Lowe, how do you think digital health technologies contribute to good practice in clinical governance and improve that continuity of care? Thank you. Look, um, I think I'm going to start off by saying that um, health, the health system as we know it clearly is unsustainable as it is, not fit for purpose. So, Clearly, there is a transition and we are in the middle of it, a revolution where we're going to be moving healthcare out of hospital walls into the community. So that transition is happening. It's happening at Ramsey's, it's happening at St. Vincent's, and we are creating a whole new division, for example, of uh, St. Vincent's at home to deal with that. So as we do that, we know that that transition has not happened in the past. The focus has always been on hospitals. And in fact, right now, governments are still investing billions in the hospitals because that's nice for politicians to cut ribbons with and win elections with. But it's not going to be the future. And we haven't been able to do it properly because we haven't had the technology and the infrastructure to do it. But now, with better wearables, better virtual care systems, we are able to support patients better in the community. And not just patients, from the hospital into their homes, but also residents in aged care facilities. As a, a lot of us, for example, at St. Vincent's, we do have aged care facilities. So that, that paradigm shift will occur, whether we like it or not. We, all, we say now, today, 90% of our business at St. Vincent's is in our hospitals, public and private. But in the future, we believe 90% will be at home. So to do that, we need technology. And as we introduce new technologies, we will introduce new models of care. Uh, to support that transition, but that's where clinical governance has to come in, right? Because the new models of care will mean new ways of working, uh, new ways of monitoring, capturing data, and how do we do all of that? How do we know that the care that we provide 
patients where they are at, whether they are in the home or whether, whether they're homeless, because we have a homeless service as well. How do we know that? How do we track the falls? How do we track medication errors? So we need to look at that. And then besides the clinical governance systems around those models of care and those technologies, we need to then also worry about the training of our clinicians and healthcare providers. How do we train them to the providers, to the universities, but, and the credentialing of these people. So right now, you need to be credentialed to do certain procedures. What about the use of technologies? So it's, it's, we're already doing some of this. The principles are exactly the same, right? It's the same clinical governance principles. We already have uh, pro, uh, pr frameworks in place to introduce new technologies and clinical practices in our health services. It's about shifting the paradigm. The regulators are already doing this. AI is now treated as a software, as a medical device. So there is already new ways of approaches. And I think as a, as a community here, we need to support what's happening and to steer it and to be proactive, not to be reactive. Does that answer the Thanks. question? Yeah. It does. And, and I think to flow from that, um, Darlene, what do you see from a patient perspective why is the clinical governance around this so important? Uh, and what's really important to patients when we're talking about digital health and continuity of care? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I just want to let you know that I'm meeting on the lands of the Ngunnawal people and pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, also, a big thanks to the consumer panel uh, before the break. They identified many of the issues, in fact, we'll be talking about all day. And they touched on quite regularly issues relating to clinical governance too, just in their telling of the story. So it demonstrates that it is absolutely key to the consumer experience of care. So um, what's clinical governance anyway? Geez, um, you ask 10 people, they'll give you a different answer. It's a bit like trying to define integrated care, I think. You know, everyone's got a, a sense of what it is. And certainly when you experience it, it feels right, you go, ah, oh, that's what it is. Um, so clinical governance, I think, is we're thinking about ultimately um, good communication, uh, a shared understanding of what's happening and why, um, a focus on delivery of high quality, safe health care every single time. Um, it's about the culture of services, about how care is delivered, about how staff are supported, how they're trained to do the job that they all want to do. Um, and it's about also um, supporting those principles around transparency and respect and partnership that are absolutely critical to a high-performing health system. Um, I think the clinical governance part is also about um, healthcare being a team sport and um, we need clinical governance to recognise that you have to collaborate, you have to share information, you have to work together. Um, no surprise to anyone here around the increasing fragmentation in our health system and uh, often you get a pretty good passage if you're on the conveyor belt of care uh, that requires an emergency department admission, some sort of intervention, discharge to um, general practice and then learn to live with whatever's happened to you. Um, but when you're actually bouncing between a range of public and private providers, it might be acute care, it might be a physio, it might be psychologist, counsellors, might be your Reiki massage therapist, a whole range of things and services that people use to keep us well, it's even harder. So that principle around the information has to follow the patient is a very important one. It will help us so that we don't have to tell our stories over and over again. And for many of us, it can just be really wearisome to tell your story over and over again. But for others, it's, uh, there's trauma involved and it can be very triggering. So we want to minimise that. And if all of us are serious about practising in um, trauma-informed ways, we have to recognise that it's part of looking after people. Um, so clinical governance really for consumers is about quality and safety of care. High quality care, you have to have um, governance around that. You have to have policies, procedures, clear responsibilities and accountability. And as we get the fragmentation too, and many of us are waiting for care, we need to know who has clinical responsibility for us. So if things deteriorate, if we're, you know, if we're getting worse, who do we ring? Who do we know who's going to have the information to help us? You know, I think, you know, Harry was absolutely on the money when he was talking about 99% of the time he is self-managing. He's managing his health. He's organising appointments, making all of the decisions required 
to keep him as well as possible. 1% of that happens with doctors. Therefore, any clinical governance has to recognise the role of consumers to be for our health literacy, digital literacy, so that we can self-manage as well as we can. So there's a few thoughts. Thanks, Darlene. And I know, Jason, you've got a particular interest in, in making sure that the clinical governance of our digital systems and our health systems more broadly are, are fit for First Nations populations. Um, do you want to share some insights about how digital health, do you think, might help continuity of care in, in that group? Yeah, thanks. So uh, for those that don't know, I, I work in a very small community by you know, Australian standards, but the largest Aboriginal community in Australia, 4,000 people in Yarrabah, which is about an hour's drive southeast of, of Cairns. There's only 350 houses there, and we sit on the other side of, uh, of Mount Yarrabah, which is a, a very high mountain range. It's, in fact, the, the steepest gazetted road in Queensland to get there. And we still rely on line-of-sight technology for our communications infrastructure. So we're using a combination of microwave dishes and satellite connections to receive our version of the NBN, for example. And so, when we're talking about the reach and effectiveness of digital tools to enhance health outcomes, and we're talking about the governance of those particular tools and how they get rolled out, we often think about this beautiful setting we're in today uh, and how the technology wraps itself over this country and how we can use it in this context. But governance and any clinical tool needs to be contextualised to the patient and their setting and their community and their culture. So you need to be both empowered and uh, engaged and encultured to the tool sets that you're using. For us, we struggle on a daily basis to have good connectivity in a community that sits outside one of Australia's largest uh, you know, tourist hubs an international airport and a destination for you know, millions a year to, to visit and yet we have huge gaps, and we talk about closing the gaps, and we're closing them, or trying to close them with stopgap measures. And I think when we're talking to designers, researchers, and they're looking at where, you know, trying to ask us questions increasingly, which is fantastic, uh, to see what are we doing in the community to make our job easier and, and connecting ourselves to the state-based health services, connecting ourselves to federal initiatives such as the recent rheumatic heart funding that's come out, which is a great news for Indigenous Australians. But looking on the ground for solutions, looking at ways of working that have existed for a very long time, and, and as uh, uh, Brendan said in the beginning, you know, looking to those sources of knowledge that sit within communities, such as the elders, such as the people working on the ground for how to get your systems to work. Cultural safety is one of my pet peeves and passions at the same time. And I work with uh, organisations across Australia trying to get people to understand that if you are going to engage with Indigenous communities, that cultural safety has to be at the cornerstone and it sh should be and always must be a part of your clinical governance because if you're going to impose a system of governance over an, a community and not understand its context, then you are, you're not providing a system of care or a tool that engenders care. You're further perpetuating a system of harm and a, and a tool that will perpetuate that harm because you're going to miss the detail either by omission or commission. And I think that, in, a sense, in essence, is how we need to work in a much more cohesive manner with communities and, and get out of our silos, as we've all sort of recognised today. There should be one silo, which I think you've mentioned, Deborah, is the patient silo. It should be our only silo of information. We should follow that person and their information around and, and be patient-centred, community-centred. And I think that is how, if we can bridge those gaps and have people engage with governance at all levels, then we'll have far better outcomes. Thanks. And a reminder to put your questions on Slido, although I can't see the Slido slides here if we've got questions coming through, but also wave if you've got a question and while you're thinking of those. Um, Bernadette, we've heard obviously that continuity of care is important for patients uh, and we know it's important to the system. Are you able to share some insights from your experience about where interoperability is working or where it's not uh, and where that where we're seeing gaps in the system currently um, and what could be done to maybe better support healthcare work. 
Thanks very much. Um, certainly have no technical expertise in, uh, in digital health from that point of view. So the interoperability question around, you know, how we can link technologies to each other outside of my realm of expertise, but absolutely around that patient management, because regardless of what system um, we're using, you know, completely agree with Erwin, hospital care will slowly become a thing of the past. Will those of us who've uh, worked in the four walls of the hospital for a long time are slowly giving that up and realising, um, as Darlene said, that patients choosing where they want to receive their health care and by who they want to provide that care um, is rapidly going to take over. Uh, funding models may not catch up as quickly, but certainly around how we're looking at um, integrated care across, across the community. I think where it doesn't work well, you don't need me to say, you know, we've got an incredibly disjointed system. We've got, uh, you know, state-run hospitals. We've got Commonwealth GP and uh, residential aged care facility. And whilst none of those systems talk, the, the clinical care delivery changes significantly. I would uh, say when I um, started nursing, you had to do a special uh, postgraduate course to undertake detailed monitoring of patients. While we would do bedside monitoring, um, if you wanted to understand um, you know, central line monitoring and a whole range of physiological parameters, that was an extra qualification. You became very highly specialised. Well, welcome to 2023. I can take my ECG myself on my, on my smartwatch. Um, patients can, can can do that. I don't. We don't need healthcare workers with special qualifications. So the question then is, um, at the moment, what do we rely on as a source of truth? If patients come in with information, oh yes, but you've been in a nursing home at St Vincent's. We're going to repeat all of those tests because you're in our system now. So I'm going to repeat the ECG that the paramedics just did, and I'm, we're going to do more bloods, and we're going to do more tests, and that's great. You've bought the information from the GP, but we're going to repeat all of that in the hospital. So I think that the source of truth of information, and then as Darlene points out, who's responsible if you are being managed and monitored at home? Who do you escalate that to? You're post-discharge, so you're outside of the hospital. Is it the GP? Is it the company that we're using to monitor your um, physiological um, or you know uh, other parameters at home, and who does that get escalated to? So I think at the moment we you know we look at clinical governance as it wraps around the location or service that's running, uh, you know that's providing care without linking any of those aspects. And I think it's um, we have to be more agile. We've got to come up with a model that is uh, is more um, agile and really is focused that the patients at the centre and the rest of us are, um, you know, providing uh, providing that service. So getting the information across is really important. I always find uh, get asked a lot to incorporate digital health into our clinical governance framework. But whereas we should be thinking digital health is something in and of itself, so how do we embed clinical governance in, into that and not sort of incorporate digital into what we already have, which is often how the conversation starts. So, you know, I, I can see that rapidly evolving. And, and in the previous session that um, Dr. Herges facilitated, that, that question around, you know, we had the burning platform in COVID, so how do we keep driving that forward? How do we say, we, the burning platform is here because as consumers are um, driving that, it's not because of the pandemic. It's because these technologies work and they provide great information. Um, so how do we, as health providers, get on board Engage. to make sure that patients are receiving access to the best care they can. Thanks. I think we've got a question on the floor. Oh, thanks very much. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts in terms of um, handoffs, so um, where digital is being used. How does that work? Is it effective, do you think? Is it is it clear? Um, if digital is not being used, how do we make that work effectively and safe, safely supported by digital? Someone want to take... Jason, maybe from the community, um, or like on the in and out of hospital I'll, type. I'll, I'll jump in. It's always that that you know that that handoff. It's right. You post discharge. You're out. You're going somewhere else. And I think digital absolutely can um, it, you know enhance that in terms of that information that's required for the patients to make decisions and for healthcare providers to make decisions. At the moment, where that doesn't join up, it become it becomes problematic. As I'll say. 
because you come into a hospital, we will repeat everything. Like, we, we want that information. So it's clearly not working at the moment, but having that, you know, an integrated digital um, solution that would allow the information to flow with the patient is, is one way that you can do that. But there has to be um, an assurance from a clinical governance perspective that this is validated data, um, that it's high quality, um, you know, that, that it's the appropriate information so that people will trust that, that they won't then repeat a range of information. And again, and I you know, appreciate Darlene's point, who then um, does the patient escalate concerns to or who is mm. managing from a clinical governance perspective? But, but how do we get a better uh, you know, multidisciplinary approach across whether it's the massage therapist, whether it's physio in hospital, and, and how do we make sure there's collective um, you know, understanding of who's got responsibility to follow up that patient or the patient has an understanding who they need to contact. I'll just add, is that okay? Yeah. 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 So you're talking about transitions of care, which is the highest risk for a patient journey. So where technology can really help, it's not just replacing paper. So we don't want people just to, instead of writing on a piece of paper, typing stuff up and then handing that over, but where we can have a source of truth that goes straight, in, straight out of whatever uh, uh, EMR or system that is being used so that we don't duplicate work, we don't introduce error, it's, it's the source of truth. And the other bit where uh, technology will help is through dis decision support systems and automation. So for example, if the patient tre uh, has met call criteria met, there is escalation automatically during those transitions. Um, there are alerts and things all happening and um, so you automate that and you also help the clinicians during those transition care to know what to focus on. So, you know, it's not just uh, turning paper into electronics, but actually providing additional help as well. You're so right there at the moment, Owen. We have, uh, you know, we've turned, we've used digital, an endless array of PDFs. You know, your discharge summary was on paper. Now you get a static discharge summary as a, a, as a PDF. But wouldn't it be wonderful if at some point in the future there was a live action list type thing that had responsibilities associated with it that the patient could see really where they're supposed to be following up and when and that the various services that were supposed to be helping that patient um, had an active digital platform on which to know who was doing what, when and how, and to know that that had been done by someone else, um, and you could find everything in one place rather than spending your life standing in front of the fax machine. Um, the query is a question, I think while we're on multidisciplinary teams, there's been a lot of discussion in the past week in particular, but for a long time around team-based care uh, and how we use more of our healthcare workers more effectively. Uh, but obviously, for people you know, engaged in clinical governance, the next question is how do you make that work? Um, and so, I don't know who on the panel wants to take, um, really how reliant will those teams be um, on, on sound clinical governance principles to make this work? I can probably chime in there. So uh, we obviously work in a very complex environment with very high needs patients. Um, uh, at the community itself is very young as well. So, uh, and the engagement with the hospital system is very high, but the GP engagement, the, our patients on average see us nine times a year to the GP alone, which is a very high engagement rate, which shows a bit of the complexity, but also the trust in the system that they have, that we are gonna carry their care appropriately. And setting up our support systems to dovetail well with hospital systems and bridging that gap with technology has been a very rocky road because of the boundaries between governance structures in the hospital and the, the checks and balances that they have in the hospital and health service. Uh, and I'm glad to hear, and certainly something I'm hopeful of the future, is that hospitals start to sort of see themselves as more part of the community and not these monolithic organisations that, that are there and, and, a, and a, an answer to themselves in a way. Our advocacy for patient outcomes is really what drives our governance approach, and we are led by community-based organisations, so the community tell us what their priorities are. We listen to them, and that's what we put forward. They wanted us during the pandemic, to, when we were doing vaccines, for example, to go out door to door, and that was the solution to us preventing the outcomes that we were told in 2020 were going to re be realised for a community like Yarraba. Uh, and, and so the trust was the first ingredient. The second was listening and you know, the whole idea of two ears and one mouth is to 
to listen patiently to the people who are there living this experience and build the structures around that. And they're not taking any prisoners, really, when you're negotiating with hospitals around their approaches. And telehealth is a classic example of that where it can bridge the gap. But we're not taught how to use telehealth. It's not a tool that doctors and nurses and clinics get taught to use as best practice. In med school and as GPs, we get an immense amount of time in how to communicate, how to maintain body language and eye contact. But I've sat in with so many telehealths where the, the clinician just stands up and walks out of the room. And my patient and I are sitting there and we're just like, how is this, how is this possible? It's really poor outcomes. And, this comes to the culture of the organisation and what they're there for and the pressures I understand. I've been in those hospital systems myself, but getting the users, the clinicians on the ground to take control of those tools and to use them just as they would a stethoscope or a scalpel with all the earnestness and, and commitment to clinical governance that they can muster. Because at the end of the day, uh, it all leads back to the patient, whether it's a good, a poor outcome or if there is follow-up care, that they're going to trust that care in, in the next step of their journey. Thanks. I think there was one on the floor. Hi. I've put up a question on um, Slido on how do we overcome the current funding model limitations to virtual care and integrated care. So I spend a lot of my time across the country standing up a lot of virtual care pilots. We get to a point with the theory that once you've done a pilot really well and you've evaluated it, you can scale it. But I've actually found in my experience it's really hard to do that, especially to link these virtual care pilots into an integrated care system, which to me the definition is seamlessly going through between primary community and acute care, um, because the funding mechanisms of Commonwealth supporting primary care, state supporting acute care, doesn't complement truly digital connected care. So, <laughs> I just wanted to ask, what was your opinion in, in starting to overcome this, to me, very big barrier? Okay, so you, you've hit the nail on the head in terms of the, uh, one of the root causes of why we have a health system that we've got. Money makes the world go round, right? So the, you've, you've described it beautifully, and the only way to solve it, really, is to shift from what we've got, which is an outcomes-based funding model, to a value-based funding model, right? Oh, sorry, my output change from the output base, which is fee-for-service, activity-based. So the more you do, the more you get paid, which rewards people being sicker and sicker, because the sicker you are, the better, more I get paid. To out outcomes-based or value-based funding, which is it should be the well, the more well you are, the more I get paid, right? So. That shift is already kind of happening in, in certain jurisdictions around the world, but we kind of need to see a wholesale change. You know, you know this is why people have seen the Medicare review that was recently, you know, the report was released. You know, governments, it's, it's, they, we have to pay for people who are sick, but we need to shift from a sick care system to a healthcare system, a true healthcare system that keeps people well. Um, because we know that prevention, you know, an analysis of prevention is better than a power of cure, right? So, that the, so the only way this can happen, really, is for people not to sit around and, and debate like, like us in this room and say, oh, well, well, unto us, what can we do? Is to actually do something within the ecosystem that you own. So what we're doing at St. Vincent's, for example, and Rams is doing the same, probably insurers are trying to do it as well. What you have control over, you try to create your own ecosystem, you try to create your own... Um, uh, economy and you provide value to, cus to consumers directly and say, look, would you pay for this? Um, people are doing this, right? Amazon, you know, there are places in the, in the US, startups that are trying to move into this space, going straight to the consumer to say, we can offer you something better uh, and we will keep you well. So for example, for example, pay me $50, pay us $50 a month, like Netflix, or you can eat healthcare, we will keep you well, all right? And the incentive then is for me to keep you well. Because the more sick you are, the more money I lose. So do you know what I mean? Like, um, that shift will happen. Look, whether it's us in this room, or whether it's a big tech company, whether it's a small startup, we will see um, a disruptor come into this space. It's like Uber and Netflix. A disruptor will come, and it's whether we want to be proactive in, in, in being part of that journey, or just watching it happen to us. And I think there is progress on 
the national level as well, because the risk of all the disruptors is that we end up with more silos. Um, and so there's that getting that balance right of enough disruption to kick the system into action to do things differently. Uh, and so certainly I think in the primary care space, that's where there is more late talk around blended funding models and integrated care and slowly a recognition of the Commonwealth that actually they do pay for some hospital care too. And hopefully they start to realise that by saving money in one, they're also saving, uh, by spending money in one, they're saving in the other as well. Um, but it has been as we all know, a really incrementally slow pace uh, and the number of pilots and trials. Uh, I think the running joke is more pilots than Qantas um, in the primary healthcare space alone. And, and so I'm hopeful that we'll start to see this shift and probably thanks to a lot of the disruptors that you, you mentioned. Um, I, you want oh, a quick no, comment just, and then we've probably got one more question. I, I was we'll... actually just going to throw to Darlene if she's there, because I know when we had um, discussed earlier around what um, you know, um, healthcare consumers are doing around driving those funding conversations, because I think that you know the powerful voice that our consumers have, but I wasn't sure if she's still online. She is still oh, there. Yep, Sorry, well, I can't see you from yeah. my angle. Sorry, Darlene. Yep, so um, waiting patiently, I am. You know, patient by uh, name and nah, title, jump patient in, by just... nature, there I am. Um, so, uh, look, it, it is about that. We have to remember that MBS is all about subsidising healthcare for consumers. Uh, for many, it might be seen as uh, money straight to doctors, to health services, but ultimately it's about subsidising care for us. So we need a reform that moves away from um, fee-for-service, the churn, getting us through the door, putting us on the conveyor belt, moving us smoothly through a broken system to something that focuses on helping us to be healthier. So I think we've touched on really important things. Uh, the Strengthening Medicare Task Force reports out now. Of course, there's plenty of um, meat on the bones for us to consider around that. But just in terms of um, all of this, well, there's a couple of things we have to keep thinking about because this is all happening, the digital health agenda is happening in the context of a number of things. One is increasing um, health inequity, people living with high rates of disadvantage, who have low health literacy, who may not have the money to access health care. Um, so many of us may have um, wearables and can afford those, and many of us do not. So we do not want to leave anyone behind as this digital health revolution finally starts to take shape. And the second is we need to think about it in the context of climate change as well and how digital health, in fact, may be able to, by reducing transport costs, by giving us information to be more efficient in, um, in running our health services, uh, in giving us information to um, be more judicious in our use of health care, we can also reduce um, carbon emissions and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, there's big social issues that digital health agenda is part of. Thanks, Darlene. Now we've got one minute left if you've got a 10 second question and a 20 second answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm just wondering from everything you've talked about and trying to get that integrated multidisciplinary care preventative back to the community, how important is it that we um, start making it easier to integrate allied health professional information into that? Because I'm hearing a lot about hospitals and GPs, but I'm wondering how we make sure it's a holistic picture of the consumer with all the um, yeah, allied health professionals across the board that they're accessing. Yeah, absolutely, and it's certainly something we're looking at in um, Ramsey. We've got Ramsey Connect, Ramsey Health Plus. So these are um, allied health services and including pharmacy that are around community either prehabilitation, um, uh, you know, post-discharge management um, and psychology as well. So it's a, a clear focus of us and we know that, um, you know, certainly something that... Um, you know, dramatically um, impacts patient outcome for the positive to have that integrated model. And I think we could have a whole another day session, I'll talk to Herbert, around digital health and the workforce. So what do we need to do to enable our current workforce and what new roles do we need? Um, so love the clinical governance discussion today. I think we need a digital health and workforce. Um, whole day. <laughs> Thank you. I'd really like to, to thank our panellists and for all of you for your questions. 
think what we can all take from that is that as we follow, we hopefully get data that follows our patient, we truly are patient-centred, um, making sure that we've got those governance principles firmly around that to protect them. Um, so thank you all.